Next up is Neil Kramer. <laughs> Neil has been <laughs> it just happens, I can't help it. Neil Kramer has been writing his personal blog, Citizen of the Month, since 2005 and produces the blogger Chris Mahanakawanza online holiday concert each December. I said it, I said it, I said it. He has worked on projects for both Disney and HBO and believes that his many years of friendship with female bloggers have made him into a better man. Please join me in welcoming Neil as he reads The Poet at the Genius Bar. That was a good line that made me into a better man. Huh? <laughs> Dear Evelyn, let me drink from your sacred glass, my mouth filled with your wine, the taste of ambrosia on my tongue so sweet. I am your servant of love, your messenger of desire. And that's when it all happened. My iPhone ran out of juice. <laughs> Crap, I said. It was 2 AM. I was drunk in bed, writing my love poem to Evelyn on my iPhone. You see, like many of you, I do everything on my phone. I, I, and I mean everything, from making movie reservations, to uh, Instagram, to even trying to get Siri to talk dirty to me. I've even slept with the iPhone on my pillow. I plugged my iPhone into the charger, but it wouldn't charge. This was serious. My iPhone was dead. And for the life of me, I could not remember one word of my poem. The next day, I woke up early, took the subway to the Apple store, and waited in line at the Genius Bar, my iPhone in hand. I was assigned to Ed, a friendly, hipster dude in his early 30s, curly hair, thick tortoise shell glasses and a goatee. How could I help you, asked Ed. I told him that my iPhone had died at the most inopportune time, and I, I was desperate. I'll see what I could do, he said, but added a warning. I might have to reboot everything, and you'll lose your data. Is that OK? My heart stopped. I pleaded with him, you need to recover my love poem. I told him about Evelyn and how this was my only chance to woo her. I told him how I met her, oh so accidentally, in the bookstore at Grand Central Station. She had just stepped off the Amtrak train. It was her first time in New York. I was on my lunch break. We talked about books, about our common admiration for Charles Dickens, John Irving, and Curious George. Or George et la Camion, as she said, since she was from Montreal, in her cute French-Canadian accent. Man, I love Canadians. I, I lied to my, I called at my office and I lied to them. I said my grandmother had died, an excuse I've been using since grade school, and spent the rest of the day with Evelyn. It was a day I'll never forget. We went uptown, we went downtown, we went here, we went there. And then, right on 6th Avenue and 52nd Street, not far from the halal meat cart, in front of the Hilton, we kissed. But alas. As in many lovers' stories, there's the moment when the star-crossed lovers must separate. She had to return to Montreal, where she had a promising career as a neurosurgeon. I waved to her as her train left the station, knowing that this might be the end. But maybe, maybe with a poem, I could change the course of history. Dude, said Ed, he's like listening, that is the most romantic story I ever heard. I'm going to recover that poem, and after you win her, I want to be invited to the wedding. <laughs> Deal, dude, I said back to him. <laughs> As Ed was working on the phone, I stood there fantasizing about the future. I imagined Evelyn and I in bed, and I'm reading the poem to her. Read me your poem again, she said. <laughs> again, I asked? Yes, I never tire of your poem. It's why I moved to New York to be with you. Read it to me over and over again. 
Ten minutes later, Ed returned, my iPhone in his hand. His expression was difficult to read. I have some good news and some bad news. First, the good news. I fixed your iPhone and was able to recover your poem. That's great, that's great, I shouted. So what's the bad news? Well, I read your poem. <laughs> it seemed that Ed was also a graduate student in the Columbia University writing program, working on his MFA. <laughs> This poem is awful, he said, shaking his head in his mouth. The taste of ambrosia on your tongue? Do you even know what ambrosia is, he asked. Uh, it's like licorice. <laughs> Rule number one of writing, he said, write from experience. Betty described her taste as a raspberry pop-tart. At least then you have some authenticity. You're lucky your phone closed down when it did. I, I, I see, I said, wondering if Siri had become so powerful that she could not only find me a restaurant with tomato soup, but could close down the phone to prevent me from sending a woman a bad piece of poetry. <laughs> Listen, said Ed, just be yourself. Just do what comes naturally. I already tried that with another woman. I already did do what comes naturally. I emailed her a photo of my penis, and she didn't appreciate it. And it was a pretty good photo. He's shaking his head. Jesus, why do men think women want to see photos of their penises? To women, our penises look like overgrown, one-eyed rats. <laughs> They'd rather hear language that melts them into putty. Men are visual, but only a woman could have an orgasm from the rhythm of an iambic pentameter. <laughs> wow, women are complicated, I said. I'm never going to understand them. I felt hopeless of ever winning the heart of Evelyn, and Ed saw the pain in my eyes. Listen, I have a solution. There is another way to win the affection of a woman, specifically created for men who can't write poetry. It's not as creative, but is a truly time-honored solution that has been proven to work. He slid a $100 iTunes card under my nose, as well as a bejeweled phone case. <laughs> What's this, I asked? It's called buying her stuff. Thank you.